Enter the world of biblical humanities, where an enriching symphony for the mind, heart, and soul plays at the crossroads of the Bible and the humanities. Hello, I'm Jesse Lee from Hubel Center, South Korea. It's a pleasure to reconnect with all of you. There exists a directive from the resurrected Jesus delivered to his disciples before his ascension to heaven. While it is frequently cited in Matthew chapter 28, 16 to 20, analogous situations are found in Mark 16, 15, Luke chapter 24, 44 to 49, John chapter 20, 19 to 23, and Acts 1, 4 to 8. Over a span of 40 days following Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, he engaged with his disciples, imparting teachings on the kingdom of God. His departing words before ascending emphasized this command. Essentially, having risen, he now possesses supreme authority in heaven and on earth. His disciples, infused with power from the Holy Spirit, are to embark on a mission to all nations, commencing with Jerusalem, to foster discipleship. It serves as both a testament prior to his ascension and an urging to perpetuate his work, entrusted to the disciples. Termed, the Great Commission, this directive has spurred global missionary endeavors. But what truly underlies this Great Commission? Primarily, it stems from an indicative statement by Jesus. Similar to God revealing his identity in the Ten Commandments, Jesus proclaimed, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The significance lies in being the recipient of the command. The one issuing the directive not only shapes its intent but also influences the recipient's response. The Ten Commandments, viewed as regulations, transform into guidelines liberating people. Likewise, the Great Commission revolves around Jesus, now the Lord of the universe. Pledging to be with us wherever we go after accomplishing universal redemptive history through his crucifixion and resurrection. In answering Jesus' call, we can fearlessly pursue wherever he leads, actively engaging in the task of making disciples. Secondly, the Great Commission is a task that unfolds by faithfully following Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, and relying on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who empowers us for witnessing. As emphasized by numerous missiologists and missionaries, when embarking on the journey to make disciples within a particular people group, it's crucial to recognize that God is already at work there. Consequently, a ministry must be attuned to the Holy Spirit's guidance, prioritizing obedience over mere assessments. The process of evangelizing and making disciples requires discernment about the appropriate time and place. Prior to initiating evangelism and discipleship, it is essential to engage in listening to the people being reached, observing their lives, and discerning their spiritual condition along with the letting of the Holy Spirit. The wisdom illustrated in Solomon's request for a wise and discerning heart emanates from a heart that listens intently, as highlighted in a hearing heart. How many evangelists, pastors, or missionaries genuinely cultivate a heart that earnestly listens to God, akin to Solomon's? The third dimension of the Great Commission, executed with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, involves reaching all nations. Despite our interconnected world through the internet and satellite broadcasts, ample opportunities still exist to share the gospel. According to Christianity Today, there are thousands of unreached people groups, having 2% or fewer evangelical Christians. Moreover, there are 300 unengaged unreached people groups, with 2% or fewer evangelical Christians and no ongoing missionary efforts. Additionally, there are frontier people groups, lacking indigenous Christian movements and possessing less than 0.1% evangelical Christians. These groups comprise a quarter of the world's population, primarily concentrated in the Hindu and Muslim worlds. Astonishingly, less than 1% of missionaries are working within this substantial population. Although evaluating individual missionary calls poses challenges, it is apparent that numerous missionaries and churches may not be fully heeding the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, the crux of the Great Commission lies in the directive to make disciples. Although going is a crucial aspect of the process, it is merely incidental. The focal point is to cultivate individuals who willingly deny themselves, carry their cross, 
and faithfully follow the Lord daily, as stated in Luke chapter 9, 23. Employing the terminology of the Great Commission, the pivotal duty is to ensure that these disciples adhere to all things the Lord has commanded, as emphasized in Matthew chapter 28, 20. Consequently, every missionary and church engaged in this mission must introspect. Firstly, they should evaluate whether they are presently adhering to the comprehensive and holistic will of the Lord. And if they are ready to make disciples in alignment with it, is the Great Commission task, fervently advocated for by churches globally, especially those in our country, genuinely a holistic and comprehensive missionary endeavor? Fifthly, the Great Commission underscores the collaborative effort of the church community in this mission. In the context of Matthew chapter 28, the recipients of the Great Commission are the 11 disciples, and in Acts 1, they are referred to as the apostles. These individuals serve as the foundation and representatives of the church, with Christ as the head. The bestowal of this commission upon them signifies that it is a directive to the entire church community. Despite the presence of doubters among them during the commission's delivery, it hints at the imperfections within the church community, while also highlighting the Lord's power and grace to transform them or use their imperfections for the fulfillment of His work. This parallels the situation in Matthew chapter 16 when Simon Peter confessed, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus named him Peter meaning, Rock, and instructed him to establish the church on that rock, suggesting that the apostleship granted to him at that moment was the foundation of the church. This didn't imply that Peter, who had just confessed the Lord as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then contested the redemptive work of Jesus, was the foundation. Instead, it indicated that the apostleship represented by Peter was the foundation of the church that he would construct. The Lord, holding all authority in heaven and on earth, is so great that he can bring his redemptive work to completion through the imperfect representatives of the church community. Amidst the grand mission, missionaries and church workers need only fulfill their respective roles. While their direct responsibility may not involve evangelizing and making disciples, they can faithfully contribute to the disciple-making ministry. For instance, one might handle the accounting for a business on the mission field or serve as a teacher or dorm director at a missionary children's school. The demand for Korean teachers globally at these schools underscores the Korean church's negligence. Despite sending many missionary children to these schools, there's a failure to dispatch teachers to support them. This mirrors the unfortunate reality of the Korean missionary system, ranking second in the number of missionaries sent abroad. A lack of missionary perspective hinders the recognition of roles like missionary school teachers as true missionaries, hampering the nurturing and sending of those with such intentions. It's time for us, who proclaim belief in the Holy Catholic Church through the Apostles' Creed, to transcend parochial views and acknowledge the universal church as the glorious body of Christ. Let's identify and fulfill the missionary roles each of us is privileged to play. Lastly, the Great Commission is not synonymous with the greatest commandment, as often asserted in Korean churches and missionary organizations. The translation or circulation of the Great Commission as the greatest commandment constitutes a significant error. While the Great Commission holds importance, it is not a biblical term but rather a creation of some missiologist. In contrast, the greatest commandment is explicitly revealed in the Bible and fundamentally differs from the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 22, a lawyer queries Jesus about the Great Commandment, and Jesus responds, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Since the greatest commandment is unequivocally revealed by the Lord, any seemingly significant great commission must be understood and executed as secondary or based on this paramount commandment. In the history of global missions, notably in Korea, the Great Commission has unfortunately been a source of significant harm as its essence has been reduced to mere evangelism. It was frequently presented as if it were the exclusive raison d'etre of the church and the saints' lives. 
The emphasis on it as the greatest commandment led many saints to unwittingly overcommit and pay a considerable price in various ways. The introduction and emphasis on Mark's statement, go into all the world and preach the gospel, as the Great Commission, exacerbated the confusion. This statement, found in an unreliable text based on manuscript evidence, prompted domestic and international missionary efforts. With perspectives and strategies divergent from those associated with Matthew's version of the Great Commission, which underscores, making disciples. For example, Framing the evangelization of all nations as a lifelong goal transformed evangelism into a sacred duty anticipated of every believer. It often became perceived as a sacred obligation, with believers feeling compelled to actively seek opportunities for evangelism, even during daily commutes. Those who did so were lauded, while those who fell short were considered guilty. To this day, Many believers grapple with confusion due to the lack of clear guidance based on revealed teachings. Despite expectations, these misunderstandings and misinterpretations persist. The Great Commission is still frequently misinterpreted as the greatest commandment, with evangelism viewed as crucial for the church's survival. Thank you for engaging in the reflection on the greatest commandment and the Great Commission. I trust it offers valuable insights. Catch you soon.